Hi, it's Jerry Arts here, a professor here at Hamlin University in the Department of Physics. And I'd like to talk just a little bit about uh, Young's modulus, stress, and also strain, and forces that would literally rip apart something. I'd like to start here with uh, basic solid material, which is typically uh, composed of molecules. And the molecules in a solid are in fixed position, uh, typically, until they have a force that is acting upon them. Uh, you can have several types of forces. Some of the forces can go along the longitudinal direction. Okay, and those types of forces would tend to rip apart, pull apart the molecules from each other. Those are called tensile forces. Or you could also have forces that act sideways that tend to slide layers of molecules over other slide uh, over other uh, layers of molecules, and those are called shear forces. Uh, the types of forces that we're concerned with are going to be tensile forces. And these tensile forces, again, act along the longitudinal axis of a particular object. Specifically here, if you have a wire uh, that is hanging from a fixed support, and let's say that it has an original length, call it L0, and what we can do is to apply a force, a longitudinal force, to this uh, wire. And I'll redraw it here, but this time I'm going to apply the force, which is going to stretch it. And so here is my force. And let's say that it gets stretched a distance here of delta L. Then the corresponding stress... This is a tensile stress, and I'll just write down stress here. And that then is defined as this force that were applied divided by the cross-sectional area of the wire. And I'll just kind of indicate it, it, uh, the area here. So this is the area A. Okay. And the amount of stretch that this wire endures is something which is called the strain. And the strain is officially defined here as delta L divided by L. And the corresponding amount of stretch here is given by Young's modulus. And Young's modulus, Y, as it's typically designated here in the textbooks, is defined here as the tensile stress divided by the tensile strain. So, you know, if we were, for example, to make a little graph here of maybe the stress along one axis and the strain along the other axis, that would, what we would typically find here initially would be a straight line, as the stress and strain are very nearly proportional to each other initially, and that goes up to something which is called the elastic limit, and uh, uh, or the proportional limit. If you go beyond that, then occasionally you can still come back to the very same uh, uh, pos position here, the original length L0. Uh, but if you proceed to go even further, then you can go off this linear relationship. And you can imagine here, you can permanently uh, deform the wire and even reach a point here where you may have fracture. Okay, so in this case, you know, what the Young's modulus is, it's totally dependent upon, upon the particular type of material that you may have. Steel has a very high uh, Young's modulus. In other words, you can have a very high stress, and uh, the amount of the strain is, 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 you know, essentially fairly small. It just doesn't stretch very much, okay? Uh, on the other hand, if you have that same stress, but then have a lot of give, namely a lot of strain, 
then you'll have a very small Young's modulus. So you have a kind of a floppy spring, if you can kind of imagine. And those types of springs have a very low Young's modulus. So when you start to talk with uh, material, you know, for example, such as uh, a rubber tire, something such as that, you know, typically it'll have quite a bit of stretch, skin in the human body uh, also has quite a bit of stretch. So that means it'll have a fairly small Young's modulus that goes along with that. So in particular here, let's say that you have a uh, particular uh, surface of a material here. And this particular surface here, I'll just kind of indicate here that uh, in this case here, what you'll have here, the force acting to the left on this material will be equal and opposite to the force acting on the right. So these two forces right here uh, for any type of material will, if it's not moving, if it's not going anywhere, if it's at rest, these two forces have got to be equal and opposite. But suppose that you have a weakness in this material. And if you have a weakness, then what's going to happen, I'll kind of redraw it here, you're going to have a bulge that results, you know, if you have, say, pressure, which is within here, and with the pressure, you know, you'll have an outward pushing out like so. And if you have a weakness in the material, you can kind of get an idea of what's going to happen. In this case here, you may have a little bulge that occurs, uh, such as a, a bubble, for example, in the tire, maybe a, a hernia, if you have muscle, something such as that. So again, in this case, I'll just indicate here that you'll have uh, force which is acting to the right. But now what's going to happen here, what you'll have is, again, you'll need to have the very same amount of force acting to the right, but this time the force is going to be acting uh, tangent to whatever that bulge is. So in order to get the same horizontal component of the force that is necessary to balance out this horizontal force to the left, we we'll have to have a much larger force here I'll try to indicate here, make it even larger yet here, so that the component of that force exactly balances out, you know, to the right, the uh, force which is acting here uh, to the left. So when this is the case here, the greater the force and the greater the bulge, the smaller the radius here, and the larger the force in that you have to have in order to balance out the force acting to the left here. And uh, as a result, the only way that can happen, I'll call this F, FT for tensile force. It's acting along here. I didn't really mean to put it in this other force is acting along this part that has not been stretched. Okay, so, so once you have a bubble, then that force, that tensile stress has got to be much, much larger. And again, I'll just call it F sub X here. These two forces have got to equal uh, each other out. So... But you also have an additional compound uh, problem here, because when you have the tensile stress, what you will also have here, remember that's going to be equal to the tensile force divided by the cross-sectional area. As you have something stretch, the corresponding cross-sectional area of that material becomes less, because it's becoming thinner, isn't it? So if that's the case, you have a less cross-sectional area, and you have a greater tensile force. So that makes an even larger tensile stress that then results. So you can see here that uh, the amount of stretch, you know, you get a larger stress then that results, and the corresponding strain uh, becomes larger and larger as a result. And the, the strength of the material just may not be enough in order to uh, satisfy this large stress and the corresponding smaller strain that results and as a result fracture then can occur or you can have a hernia in the case of, uh, of a uh, uh, tissue muscle tissue or you can have a blowout in the case of a tire and uh, and that can happen very very quickly so uh, that does it and again uh, Cherry Arts in today's date, 5 8, 2016. Thanks a lot. We'll see you. Bye bye.